So last week we started this sermon series, Doing Justice. And we looked at the question, what is justice? Well, that was part one. Today we're going to be looking at what is justice, part two. And we are going to find the answer in the most surprising place. And that is Deuteronomy 15 verses 1 through 11. So Deuteronomy 15 verses 1 through 11 is a portion of scripture where the heart of God for the poor is clearly seen through his laws. And I don't know if you know it or not, but that is justice. In verses 1 through 5, God decrees the cancellation of debt every seven years, known as the year of canceling debts. And what this did was it instituted a cycle of release and reconstitution for Israel's socioeconomic system. And this law was very revolutionary in its nature. It was very revolutionary in its nature because what it does is it limits the potential cycle of generational poverty. And it offers the debtor the possibility of a new financial beginning. It paints a radical picture of God's heart for justice and God's heart for fairness, fairness as well as God's compassion for the poor. Verse 4. Verse 4 contains a promise that there need be no poor people among you. There will be no poor people among them if they follow God's commands faithfully. And this wasn't or this isn't or this is not based on uh, utopian ideals but on the concrete provisions of God. Uh, the concrete provisions that God has set in place to protect and care for poor people. As a compassionate people, as compassionate people, our hearts have to resonate with this command. This law was more than societal framework, but it is an expression of the very heart of God. God isn't suggesting sporadic acts of kindness. But he is demanding, watch this, a complete economic restructuring. Every seven years, all debts were to be canceled, giving everybody a fresh start. And this, my friends, is radical. This is revolutionary. Or that is radical. That is revolutionary. Because it reflects the nature of a God who looks at the, mar who looks at the marginalized, who looks at the disenfranchised, and he declares justice for them. Verses 7 through 11 emphasize an open-handed approach to the poor and needy. The Israelites are commanded to be liberal, 
freely giving and lending to the poor what they need. And the heart of this command, what it does is it goes beyond action and it points to the intention behind it. God, what he does is he encourages a willingness to give cheerfully without grudgingly uh, withholding out of fear or selfishness. And that is one of the key principles in the concept of giving. The act of selfless giving, it shows our obedience to God and our love for others. Verse 11, what verse 11 does is, verse 11 here, it injects a dose of realism. It, it, it introduces a dose of realism. God knows that poverty will persist. Watch this. Because human sin in a fallen world. But instead of freeing them from the responsibility, God's people are told to be intentionally open-handed towards the poor and needy. This is a strong social and moral statement. And, and verse 11 begins with a solemn note. There will always be poor people. The, the world we live in is still broken. The world we live in is still marred by sin. The world we live in, uh, its consequences uh, uh, are, are vast. And, and one of those consequences is poverty. And while that may paint a dark picture, it does not free them from the responsibility. But rather, it invites them to actively participate in alleviating poverty. And needless to say, it invites us too. As someone once said, the idea that some lives matter less is the root of all that is wrong with the world. The idea that some lives matter less is the root of all that is wrong with the world. Listen, church, we are called to reflect God's justice. We are called to reflect his mercy for all. And what is this justice that God requires from us? God desires. He desires for us to reflect his loving concern for the poor. He, he desires for us to reflect his loving concern for the vulnerable. He desires for us to reflect his loving concern for those living on the fringes of society. This is justice. This is justice acting righteously, caring for the needy, and setting oppressed people free. This passage, it highlights the interaction between divine commands and human responsibility which is God's vision for his people. And his, God, and his vision for God's people rest on that. And these principles in Deuteronomy 15, they, they challenge us to rethink our understanding of mercy. It, it challenges us to rethink our understanding of justice and reflect God's heart, and reflect God's heart in our actions for the poor and needy. The economic policy put forward in Deuteronomy 15 is radical. It presents a system designed to prevent systemic poverty. It presents a system 
designed to control excessive wealth accumulation and resist economic oppression. And all those, these regulations, they might not quite apply today, but the spirit behind them is God's concern for justice, his concern for equity, and his concern for the poor. And that must permeate our lives and inform our response to poverty and economic injustice. As we try to live out these principles, we find a beautiful harmony between Old Testament law and New Testament grace. And we find that in none other than the person and work of Jesus. Jesus, through his teachings in life, he, he affirms and intensifies these principles. The Old Testament concern for the oppressed finds its fulfillment in Jesus, and it finds his fulfillment in his finished work on the cross. In Philippians 2, 6 and 7, Paul tells us, Paul tells us that though Jesus was God, watch this, he became poor, taking the very nature of a servant, humbling himself to the point of death, even death on the cross. You see, God's heart for the marginalized is so profound that he himself shared in their experience. The good news of the gospel is that through his sacrifice on the cross, Jesus, what he did was he set us all free. What Jesus, he did was he canceled all debt. He, he canceled all debt of our sin that we could never repay on our own. <laughs> he, he, he canceled all, all debt. Somebody wrote a song the other day that said, Jesus dropped the charges. On Calvary, when he proclaimed, case dismissed, saved by grace, Jesus dropped the charges. And as we open our hearts, as we open our hands to those in need, we become walking, living testimonies of Jesus' redemptive work. Our justice and mercy to the poor remind them and ourselves of the grace we, we, we receive from Jesus. His sacrifice, it was not a legal transaction, but it was God's ultimate act of love and, and, and excuse me, his ultimate act of love and justice. We can learn a lot about justice through looking at Deuteronomy 15. It can help us live lives that reflect what Jesus has done for us. It can help us to generously forgive as we've been forgiven. Freely sharing what we receive and tirelessly loving as we are loved. This, my friends, this, brothers and sisters, is justice. This is love. This is the gospel in action. Let's pray. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we come thanking you, come giving you honor, Lord, for taking these few verses and showing us what justice looks like. Lord, we pray that 
as we have and the things we take for granted that we have. Lord, we pray that that would make us mindful to be thankful. To be thankful to you. And Lord, may that break our hearts for our brothers and sisters that don't have. God, we thank you that we serve a God of justice. And a God that has a heart for the marginalized, the downtrodden, the forgotten about the poor. And Lord, we pray that you would give us your heart so we can feel what you feel. Give us your heart, Lord, so we can feel like you. Give us your heart so we can love like Give us your mind so we can think your thoughts after you. And God, we pray for those that don't know you this morning. Lord, we pray that they got a proper introduction to you. And Holy Spirit, we pray that you would do your regenerating work and change that heart of stone for a heart of flesh. In Jesus' name. Do it now, God. And save them in the stillness and quietness of their heart. Then, God, we pray for those that know you. Lord, we pray that something was said that we would be brought in light to insult their soul. Lord, we pray that your light would shine someone else. That people would come out and say, what must I do that I might be saved? In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen.